Today I have a topic that is probably one of the hardest topics to communicate about because it is a topic that each and every one of us must deal with and it's a topic that each and every one of us have to understand that this is a maturity topic. I do not believe that you can handle this topic until you first come to the point that I have to understand that I need to be mature in my actions because the myth that we're talking about is forgiveness means forgetfulness. And that is a myth. If anyone have ever had sin in your life or that you've had somebody that caused a problem within your life and they hurt you and it was deep, you're not going to forget it. You can say you want to forget it. You can ask God to wipe it from your memory. But the pain is so deep within our hearts and within our lives, it motivates us. And sometimes it even causes bitterness and anger. Sometimes even want to retaliate. But the Lord's Prayer that Justin just read, in verse 8, it says, In this manner therefore pray. What's the next two words? Our Father. This prayer is talking to you if you're a child of God. Because unbelievers, they do not have Father. They know Jesus. But this is talking to the disciples. This is talking to the church. And he says, we have to do this. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And verse 12 is the most powerful verse that if Christians get a hold of this, it could revolutionize the way that they see others and the way they see God. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Forgiveness is a myth when you think that you have to forget in order to forgive. If you think that you have to forget before you can forgive, we all have no idea what forgiveness is all about. Forgiveness is not forgetfulness. It is a spiritual myth, an urban legend, if you would. Forgiveness is a tough and touchy subject. And there's very, very, very many people that have, in their past, have major pains. Maybe because of abuse, maybe because infidelity, Maybe some very difficult things that you deal with and you deal with every day and you wake up in the morning and you have to deal with some things and I'm going to ask you today to do something that, that maybe that you've thought about but you have no desire to do. But write this down. Forgiveness is not an option. It's a command by God. It's not an option. If I feel like it, I'll forgive. But forgiveness is not an option if you're a child of God. Colossians chapter 3 verse 13. Bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you must forgive. Not if you feel like it. Not if it wasn't a bad offense. I can forgive somebody for lying to me or I can forgive somebody for doing something. But when it comes to a deep, hardcore issue... I don't want to do it. And sometimes we just won't do it. But the Bible says we must do it. And the last part of the Lord's Prayer when he tried to explain what he said, and Justin read this as well, for if you forgive them their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Forgiveness is a decision of the will. I want to take a break here and, and talk about the two different aspects of forgiveness because we have to understand the, the two aspects of forgiveness. One is a judicial aspect of forgiveness. And if he is your father and you are a child of God, when you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, your penalty of sin was put under the blood. In other words, you're a child of God. God holds no record of your wrongs if you're a child of God. 
So that means the judicial system, when God looks at you, he does not forget your sins. He is not holding you accountable to your sins. And your sins are wiped away. God loves you. God is an omniscient God. He's all-knowing. He knows everything about you. But he can look at you and not look at your sin. He can look at his son. And that is the judicial aspect of forgiveness. But then we have the other aspect. The other aspect is the relational aspect. Our father, dad, a parental aspect of forgiveness. That means on a daily basis, I have to confess my sins in order for Jesus to forgive my sins, not because of my salvation, but because of my relationship. Even in the upper room, the day before Jesus was being crucified, they got into the disciples in the upper room and they were discussing who's the greatest amongst them all. And, and Jesus got a little perturbed, I think, with them because he, they're missing the point. So Jesus got up and, and he took a wash basin and he, he put a, a, an apron around him and he got on his knees and he started washing the disciples' feet. And Peter said, no, 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 you're not going to wash my feet. And he got mad. He, he goes, if you're going to wash my feet, wash all of me. And Jesus said this. He said, you are all clean except for one. You do not need to be washed all over because you're already a believer in Jesus. But what you must do is you must allow me to wash your feet. And he's given us a spiritual application that some days that we just need to fall on our face before God and say, God, I'm saved, I know, but I have sin in my life and I need you to forgive me. And he is faithful and he's just to forgive us of all of our sins and to cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. But sometimes on a daily basis, when we have sin in our life and we have problems with somebody else, we have to be willing to say, I was wrong. Forgive me. And sometimes that's hard to say. And sometimes it's hard to say because who you're saying to may not have the past abilities to forgive. And sometimes when we ask somebody to forgive, Sometimes we look at them and we're afraid to say something, so we just keep our mouth shut because we really don't know exactly what to do. But the spiritual myth is widely held belief that genuine forgiveness means literally forgetting what has happened. And I want to give you a few wrong perceptions of that before I tell you what the antidote would that be. The wrong perceptions of forgiveness is induced spiritual amnesia. We are too intelligent. Our brains are intelligent. And we do not easily forget. And when somebody has hurt us, we hold that deep within our hearts. Here's the problem of that concept, though. We look at what God does, and we understand what God does. And God doesn't forget when he forgives. At least not in the way that we commonly think about forgetting. Sometimes we think that, well, God says he forgets. And I want to explain that aspect in a second. Forget means to, the inability to recall something. Such as, uh, I, anybody like this, I don't know where my car keys are. Anybody ever do that? Uh, I don't know where I left my glasses. Um, I lost something. I forgot something. Jeremiah 31, 34 says that God, for I will forgive their wickedness, and I will remember their sins no more. We think that means that God just forgets. But God is an omniscient God. How could God be an omniscient God and know everything about everyone and forget sin and forget what you have done? Then in Psalms 103, 12, it says, As far as the east is from the west, so far he removed our transgressions in them. So I want to give you a word. It means that God renews his work. Forget means I am going to put you in a place and I'm going to set you apart and I'm going to give you a renewed purpose. I am not going to hold your sin against you. I'm going to allow you to use who you are and I'm going to give you a renewed purpose. Let me give you a for instance. The Bible says that Noah floated around for nearly five months in the ark and then God remembered him. Does that mean that God had this, this flood to cover the whole earth, and he was overdoing something else, and he forgot that Noah was in the ark. Does that make sense? 
No. At that time, at that moment, God had a renewed purpose, and he set Noah's course, and he said, now is the time. When he forgets, he says, I'm going to give you a purpose in order for you to accomplish, and I am not going to allow you in your sin to not have a way of life. I want you to be forgiven, and I'm going to set my heart and set it fast for you. The same goes for many biblical stories in the Bible, such as Adam and Eve, such as David and Bathsheba. Major sin. One changed the entire universe of sin nature, and one was infidelity, and David cried in his heart, and I, I, I want to just read this to you. And you, you've read this many times. But God had a plan for David. And David, when he was approached by Nathan, and David the king sinned, Nathan the prophet came up to him and said, you are the man that sinned. David's heart was broken. And this is what David said in a prayer to God. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitudes of the tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquities and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts and in the hidden parts. You'll make it known. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness, that my bones you are broken for me may rejoice. Hide your face from my sin, and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew my steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and upon me your spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud your righteousness. O Lord, on my lips and my mouth shall show forth your praise. You know, David is saying, I know I can't lose my salvation but I've lost the joy of my salvation. I, I, was in, I had infidelity and I even murdered and I lied and I was confronted and I lost that joy. I lost that peace within my life and David was a broken man and he cried out to God. He said, clean, create in me a clean heart, O Lord. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Restore to me the thing that I miss, and I need your love. C.S. Lewis said this, Everyone says forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have something to forgive. It's a great idea for you. It's a great idea for you. But when I have to forgive, when you hurt me, even when you don't want me to forgive you, but because I'm a believer in Jesus and I must forgive, whether you ask me to or not, whether you change your life or not, my, God, my job is to honor God. And he asked me to forgive. So I must forgive. I cannot be the ostrich. I cannot stick my head in the sand and say, maybe it'll go away. Because God sees all, and he's given us an opportunity to do what he's asked us to do. We must do that. We have to do that. God no longer responds to us in the light of the sins. They no longer derail our relationship with him. They no longer receive his wrath. They are gone completely from our account. That is exactly what God does for us. But let me give you the misconception. The first problem is that we think that we can opt out of forgiving others. We think we can just opt out. We don't think we can. We don't think I have the ability. If, if, if I have to forgive to forget... And I know that I'm not going to forget. I know my heart. And I'm going to be mad. 
So if I have to forget in order for me to successfully forgive, I'm just going to opt out because I know I can't do it. So I just might as well not even try. The second problem is disillusionment and anger with God. Because here's what we think. If I can't forgive and forget, then I must be doing something wrong. And then we get the mindset that if I gave my heart to Christ and Christ forgave me of my sins, I, if he forgave me and he put the sins behind his back and he's not going to bring it to his remembrance no more, why am I dealing with the circumstances of my sin? If I have sinned and I ask God to forgive me of my sins and, and, and he says you're forgiven, then why am I still having so many circumstances out of my control? Because I think if God loved me, he would create in me an opportunity for me not to deal with my circumstances. But that's not the way God works. He will forgive your sin, but he will not change your circumstance. He will create in you a clean heart. But he's not going to change your circumstance. Because in the sin, in the lack of forgiveness, we still have to deal with our issues. The third significant problem is unrealistic expectations. Um, we assume... that if I ask you to forgive you, I ask you to forgive me, and you say yes, then the restoration should automatically take place. I shouldn't remember your sin. I shouldn't remember the action. I shouldn't remember the lies. If I say you're forgiven, and in reality, that doesn't happen. If somebody that's a child molester comes to this church and they give their life to Christ, they're not going to be working in the nursery. I'll forgive them, but I'm not going to give them permission. Would you agree with that? Although, I'm not going to hold them against them, and I'm going to love them, and I'll help them, and I'll encourage them, but I am not going to put kids in harm's way. Have I forgiven them? Absolutely, but that does not mean I'm going to forget what they do. I'm going to remember what they do, but I'm going to keep my people safe or keep our family safe. Ephesians 4.26, it says, Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. And sometimes we have to deal with issues and we can't wink at them. We have to deal with those things that are in front of us. In Hebrews 12.15, it says, Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. Let any root of bitterness spring up, cause trouble, and this becoming defiled. What we must do is we must look at the issues. We may not agree, but we can forgive. But just because we forgive does not mean we're going to forget. It means we're going to hold to a higher accountability. It means that we're going to love them, but we're not going to forget what they do. Forgiveness is a decision that is lived out daily, and it's a lengthy process. It is something that we have to get up daily and say, I am going to live my life as a forgiving individual. I'm not going to allow the sins of others to affect who I am. I'm not going to allow the sin of my father, the sin of my mother, to deal with who I am. I have to deal with that myself. I can forgive them, but that doesn't mean I'm going to restore that relationship automatically. That means it takes a process. The fourth significant problem is sometimes we just quit trying. If I have to forget... In order to forgive, I just won't have a forgiving spirit. The problem with that is in Matthew chapter 6, if we don't have a willing spirit to forgive, we're in trouble with God. Because he says, it is not something I want you to do, it's something I'm commanding you to do. As a child of God, we have to remember where we came from. And we have to remember that we did need forgiveness and I have to ask God to forgive me on a daily basis. And sometimes I need to look in a mirror and say, you know what, I know who I am. I know where I came from. I know what I am, have the abilities to do. And I know that on a daily basis I have to ask God to forgive me. And sometimes I have to ask others to forgive me. So what is the proper way to look at it? The first realm is the spiritual and it's the eternal realm. It's the judicial. Before I'm willing to forgive you, I have to know that God forgave me. 
And I have to have confidence that he forgave me. It is eternal relationship with God that he loves me and he's going to take care of me. It's a spiritual and eternal relationship of my forgiveness. And the second is the earthly and temporary realm. In other words, I have to be willing and humble enough to say, I was wrong. Forgive me. Now, here's your aspect of that. When somebody comes to you and they were wrong and they say, will you please forgive me? Don't say you're forgiven until you first are ready to forgive. What that means is, if we have the spirit of forgiveness, what we can do is we can say, yes, you're forgiven. But if we say you're forgiven, but yet you still have a bitterness and anxiety within your heart and you still have anger about that, say, thank you, thank you. Let me pray about that. Let me get back with you. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for your humility. Because now, it's on me. Now I have to have that spirit and humility of accepting that forgiveness and giving that forgiveness. Sometimes it's very difficult. Desmond Tutu, in the book, No Future Without Forgiveness, says this. Forgiving is not forgetting. It's actually remembering. Remembering and not using your right to hit back. Not using your right to hit back. So, in Marriage Counseling 101, it says this. When you ask for forgiveness, and forgiveness is given, there's no reruns. What's your favorite rerun? Mine's Hogan's Heroes. I'll watch Hogan's Heroes all night long on, on me TV. I love Hogan's Heroes. But a rerun is this. We got in a fight over that five months ago. And I asked for forgiveness, and you offer forgiveness. Well, guess what? We have to learn to quit fighting about the stuff that we've already dealt with. We have to deal with today. We don't have to deal with yesterday. If we already dealt with yesterday, quit watching the reruns. Quit dealing with the things that caused problems in the past. It's over. It's done. We've worked through it. Quit using reruns. Ignoring grievances will never work. But dealing with our issues on a daily basis always works. We must do that. So how do we make progress? Let me, let me boil this down. The first thing we have to do is we have to stop keeping score. We have to stop keeping score. Sometimes we get confused in Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 and 22. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I need to forgive him? Seven times? And Jesus said to him, I don't say to you seven times, but 70 times seven. Whoa, what do you mean by that? Jesus is saying this. He goes, guys, don't put a number on it. Use your heart. If you love somebody and they're working through it, people may fail. People may goof up. Love them through it. Don't demand excellence. Demand love. When Jesus spoke about forgiving, he wasn't saying you have to do this, you keep a record. He's saying look at people through the eyes of your heart, through the condition of your spirit. Forgiveness is a very mature act. We have the amazing ability to undercount our own misdeeds while multiplying the wrongdoings of others. You're worse than me. You always do that. I never do that. And we always multiply somebody else's problems, but we always undermine our own problem. And we can't do that. Jesus tells a parable of Matthew chapter 18 about an unforgiving spirit, a servant. Uh, this man owed the king thousands of dollars, if you would. So much that he would never be able to repay. And it was time to, for him to pay. So he went up to see the king and he said, King, I, I need a little bit more time. And the king says, I'm going to give you better than that. Your debt is forgiven. As if you never owed me. He, oh, wow. Man, anybody ever been in debt and you got everything paid off? It's like, oh, praise Jesus. I, I don't have a car payment. I don't have a house payment. I have, I have a little bit of extra money. It, it makes you feel wonderful. But yet the servant that owed the money went from the king and he went to another guy's house that owed him a little bit of money. And the guy says, I don't have the money. And the servant that was just forgiven a lot threw the servant that owed him a little into debtor's prison because he didn't appreciate 
the forgiveness that one gave him, but he threw another man into prison because he owed him a little. And when the king heard what he had done, he called that servant back up to the house, and he said this, Is it true that I forgave your debt, but you would not forgive his debt? And he said, I reestablish your debt. Pay it now. The man couldn't pay it. What a lesson that we learn. How much forgiveness have we received? How much forgiveness have you received from Jesus? I owe him all. I owe him everything I have. I would be dead in my sins and I'd be going to hell. But because of what Jesus did, I'm forgiven. And because he forgave me, my job is to forgive others. Not stick my head in the sand and say it didn't help. But deal with those issues and care for them. The fourth and final thing we need to do is let God be God. Let God be God. For we are not return evil for evil. God promises that we will handle the matter in his own time. In Romans 12 it says this. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. You know, we say this, sue them in the court of heaven. In other words, pray about it. In other words, Give it to God. And sometimes when we have a spirit that I'm just mad, that person hurt me. It hurt, hurt me to the core. And I'm 53 years old, and that happened when I was 15, and I still get mad every time I think about it. Anybody like that? You just hate it. And you can even think about it, and you dream about it, and you get mad. What do you do? You know what you have to do? Is you have to ask God... To change your heart. You don't have to ask him. You have to ask him. Lord. It hurt. Because the great physician. Is not only a physical physician. He's a spiritual. He's in our emotional. And he's our gift. And what we can do is say Lord. I need you. To change. My heart. Towards them. Because you're not going to be able to forgive. Unless it's for him. Somebody hurts you deep. Somebody hurts you bad. God's the only one that's going to change your heart. He forgave you. Ask him. Say, Lord, I give you permission. I, I have this issue. And he knows your heart. He knows he loves you. He wants you to change. Trust, close relationships, and forgiveness are not always related Sometimes we have to ask God, I need to give somebody else trust and hope and care. See, when Jesus died on the cross, he said, it is finished. He said, it is finished. My redemptive work to redeem you from your sins is finished. It's finished. We said this on Good Friday. Surely he has borne our grief. And carried our sorrows. He was esteemed. And stricken. Smitten of God. And afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. Forgiveness. It's a big deal. Forgiveness. Is redemption. And we can say thank God. For what he has done for us. And then Jesus says, I want you to be Christ-like followers. And if Jesus' big deal was to die on the cross, to redeem you of your sins, to forgive you, and if you're supposed to be Christ-like followers of him, one of the greatest things that we can do as Christians is to emulate forgiveness. Not anger, not attitude, and not bitterness, but love and forgiveness. Here's what David said at the end of his psalm. Deliver me from the guilt of the bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation. And my tongue 
shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. You know when you can praise? You know when you can worship? Is when you get in your heart that I'm forgiven. Jesus did this for me. There may be times in your life that you feel like the sin is so much. You've done too much. I've hurt God. I've hurt others. And I just don't know what to do. God wants to break your heart like he broke David's heart. And when God breaks your heart, you have nothing else but saying, Lord, I need you. I need you. And he's going to come out and create in you a clean heart. And this is what's going to take place. When God creates in you a clean heart, because you broke God's heart, and then here is the Christ-like followers, then we are supposed to be Christ followers when somebody breaks your heart. We're not easy to judge. We can be kind, but we can be forgiven. And what we can do is we can work through reconciliation. Forgiveness and reconciliation are two totally different things. Forgiveness is my issue. Reconciliation is our issue. I can forgive you without you ever forgiving me. I can replace our relationship. And I can forgive you. And I can go to bed at night with my head on the pillow knowing I've done everything within my power to do what God has asked me to do. That's forgiveness. Whether they want reconciliation, not the issue. The issue is God has called you to forgive others. And when you can forgive others, you may, you may still remember it. But all you're doing is saying, I am not going to allow that sin, that person, to keep me from doing what God wants me to do. And that is the biggest step of maturity that you could have, is wanting to obey God and ask God to work within your life. So the invitation is difficult. Let me give you a round. Anybody ever need forgiveness? Today? In the last 30 minutes? Since I've been preaching? <laughs> that stupid jerk, he needs to shut that up. We all need forgiveness. And we all need to be forgiven. And we all need to forgive.